I might be being a little quiet because my roommate's asleep in the other room. Maybe it's gonna be a problem, but hopefully not. <clears throat> so we're talking about breathing. This is part two. So we make a sound on the out breath. In Alexander, we just make a sound on the out breath. In Buddhist meditation, we dissolve and go out. Maybe we do it in Alexander too, but <clears throat> maybe you don't get the instruction, but hey, here it is. And then it, it, it's important in Buddhist meditation that you don't manipulate the in-breath. You may think you're making big noise on the out-breath, which is great. No problem. There's no problem. But don't try to make big noise on the in-breath. There is no big noise to be made. There's no special effort to be made on the in-breath. Don't make a big gesture because you think you made a big gesture on the out-breath. In-breath is completely natural. Nothing is done to interfere with the naturalness of the in-breath ever. I mean be very advanced, some completely different topic if it were. <clears throat> and, it, and it's going to change. Your in-breath is going to change, I believe. But it's not your business. I mean, it's not your business to worry about that too much. I mean, interesting. Oh, look at that. My breath is getting kind of big. It's not time for you to inflate your ego. No. Just boycott it. No, you can notice it, but do not get in there and jump on the bandwagon about that. You just let that happen. So that is the Buddhist instruction about not manipulating the breath. It is, I'm giving the clear instructions on that. We're not manipulating our breath whatsoever, except that we're learning slowly, gradually, tiny little increments to have to go in this direction of letting go on the out breath. That's a good way to go. That's pointing towards the grandmother's finger. That's what we're talking about. And we don't get, I mean, they don't tell you what I'm telling you, you know, early on, you know, maybe this is, I've been doing this for a long time. It took me a long time to figure this out, you know. But I was uh, very lucky to receive these Alexander teachings and then be able to join with our Buddhist practice. And it just has been invaluable every second to where <clears throat> and what happens after meditation is more important than what happens in meditation. That can't be said for everybody. Everybody doesn't get that very important point. Uh, it, Alexander is going to help you so much. With Alexander, you can realize this easily, much more easily than you're going to be able to otherwise. Otherwise, you're going to get up, walk off the cushion, and you're going to go back to your old habits. Your old habits are so strong. You're just going to go back to where you were, and you're, you're just not going to understand you just need more tools. Because you're a Westerner, because your kinesthetic system has been debauched by growing up in a debauched kinesthetic world of other people whose kinesthetic systems are debauched, you just need extra curricular, you know, you need after school work on how mindfulness can be applied in a practical and helpful and way that makes you excel at what you do and able to learn. You know, this is about learning. Right now, you're kind of unable to learn. You don't know what learning is. You don't understand what wisdom is, really. A little bit, maybe, if you've been practicing for a while. You know a little bit about what wisdom is, but you just don't walk through that door very often. You just, you, you don't, you know, I'm always leaning lean on that. But you can, just a matter of 
of gaining the skillful means and applying it, and then the wisdom is just immediately there. It's always been there. <clears throat> There's not a lot to say that from Alexander's point of view. There's not a lot to say, you know, from a Buddhist point of view. I can't, I can't do this for you. I can't. That's kind of all I can do. And then you try it and you do it and it'll work. And we'll try some more things. The reading is pretty simple, but it's mostly in the doing, you know. I just, if I got a student, Alexander student, we do the breathing, there's not too much for me to say. They do it. And that's it. Keep doing it. Ten. Alexander thought people might get a little woozy doing too much of this. He didn't want you doing a lot, you know. Maybe do ten breaths and maybe stop. Let's not get dizzy, too dizzy or too... Um, sometimes in Buddhism they talk about uh, Naropa received these powerful teachings and then he fainted so you know it's a little bit like that you kind of faint in a way so we don't want you just going into a big faint and not coming out of it so, you know that's not helping anybody so you just do a 10 breath stop let's relax you know, five minutes. Later on, you can do more. You can do more. You can do more. And then, you know, I came to the brilliant conclusion that, oh, Buddhist meditation and Alexander breathing are very, very the same thing, you know. But maybe you don't, you don't have to do that. It took me, I didn't do that right away, you know. You know. Eight years into it, dong, the lights go off or whatever. But then once I got into it, I, I really, you know, 20 years into it, I had this realization. But I had done a lot of it. You know, I'd done 20,000 hours of it on and off the cushion. But I realized if I could hear that sound in my throat on the cushion, I knew I was letting go. And I knew the point of this was letting go. I mean, that's not, I'm not saying it's not the only point, but that's, there's at least half. You let go, but then you didn't go anywhere. That's the other half. You let go and dissolve, and there's no damn place to go. So that's all you got to know. If you don't ever let go and dissolve, that's not quite it. And then if you don't figure out, you gotta come out of that, and that's nothing big deal. That's nothing to try to hang your hat on either. You just come back and breathe in. It's the same, same. There ain't no difference. If, I'm, if I hear that sound, I know I'm letting go. And, I know it's as virtuous in my meditation. And I'm not saying you have to do that all the time, but it's, it's very powerful just to keep letting go. And then you just figure out that letting, oh, it's about letting go. And so now I'm off the cushion. I got all these other tools with Alexander really just ah, teaching me how to let go. So I got to apply all these other tools. Just mainly, I would say, you know, good head and shoulders. Good head and shoulders. Trump Rinpoche says the main thing for a warrior is good head and shoulders. What does that mean? He says the head is not in conflict with the shoulders. So Alexander, he's saying... The main point is the, is the tension of the neck and how that affects the head. But in a way, it's the head leads, the body follows. The head leads toward this place of, uh, 
unstuckness. You know, really, you're probably just like making one mistake after another until you attain enlightenment. That's that's what we think in the Kagyu school of Tibetan Buddhism. We just make, and mindfulness is just make it, didn't quite get it, didn't quite get it, didn't quite get it enlightened. Or maybe, you know, I did quite get it, but it didn't last. But really, it's better to think you didn't quite get it, but it, it would still was good. I mean, doing it wrong is just as good as doing it right. We always want to be right. That'll just get you nothing. Being wanting to be right and insisting on being right will get you like an ego place in the Hall of Fame. That's what you get. Total misery, suffering, just opposite of what you wanted. You just want to be wrong. You just want to be interested. Is it? What is it? It's my life. I really should pay attention. I really should figure out what is my life. What? What is the suffering? What is the suffering itself? What is the cause of the suffering? This is what we do in Alexander. We. We discover the suffering itself. We discover the cause of the suffering, which is the fact that we're freaking out and going the wrong way all the time with these habitual patterns we got going. We just got a lot of stuff in here telling us to freak out and go the wrong way. And we just have to like, do, 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 do. Oh, yeah, I'm going the wrong way. Oh, I can see that. Oh, and that's so interesting. It's so interesting to see how I try to cram my head back into my body like a turtle. Fright flight. Samsara. What if I just... Number one, notice. Number one, notice. Number one, notice what's... What's up? What's up with me? Or what's up? With, what's up? What's up with my head and shoulders? What's happening with my neck? What's happening with the level of tension in my neck? How's that affecting the way I'm using my head? And that's translating to the whole body. Head leads, body follows. So we just teach ourselves how to be delicate and interested in how we use our head and our neck and our shoulders, how we use our head and shoulders. We try to work out, go from a sense of always being in conflict, always being frozen, always being freaking out, always being going another the other way, to teaching ourselves how to go toward nirvana or Zogchen, or uh, we say head free, <laughs> head free. You know, usually Alexander. Well, I mean, when you're thinking, your head is not free. <laughs> There's more to it than that. When you're not thinking, head be free, but it's a, something's happening in the body. It's not like that either. It's not a dichotomy of not thinking and thinking. It, right now, you don't know what not thinking is. You don't know what freeing your body is. So that's a problem, but you don't know that. But even if those people I talked about who uh, 